started, and I'm sure we'll have others floating in. It always seems to be the Venture Cafe way of being here about 10 minutes into the session. So, but welcome to um, I-10 Second Thursday. I'm Melissa Grizzle, I'm the Director of Entrepreneur Development with I-10. Um, the second Thursday of every month, we partner with Venture Cafe, um, have since they started in the fall of 2014. Um, so we have a main, ad, main event at 5.30 here in Havana. We always have a small group discussion um, in the hour preceding this, and our mentors are having office hours and are in the community gathering area. Um, so welcome. I um, apologize for my voice, I'm getting over a cold, so I will not babble on any longer because we have three fabulous people here to share their wisdom in many different areas of product development. And they have a ton of great information, and we definitely want to leave um, time at the end for lots of, uh, of uh, Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to let you guys kick it off. And if you want to each introduce yourselves, and then Margie, I think you're, you've got the, the, the beginning of the presentation. Okay. All right, and I'll uh, transfer the power of the clicker. Oh, there we go. The power. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Margie Skillion. I'm VP of Architecture at Object Computing Inc. for a local firm that's basically software development. So let's our skill set. Uh, Lee Lair and Omnitech. We're a technical consulting shop specializing in free software. Uh, my name is Thomas Stem. I am a, a serial entrepreneur, almost a serial entrepreneur. I'm on my second company now, uh, which is a startup company. Uh, technology consulting company headquartered in St. Louis as well. So there you go. I'm going to jump up if you guys don't mind. I'm going to stand over here. Um, here's just kind of give you a really quick intro for all of this. So we've got 10 startups. I want you guys to guess how many startups will succeed. How many light bulbs you guess are going to stay on? Everyone take a guess at that. Okay. One. One. Three. Okay. Two. Yeah. Two. Whoops. I did the wrong thing there. Two. Whoops. Woo. said two. Yay. <laughs> yay. Actually, there, it goes from one to two to three. There's a 90% number that's out there that actually, they've done some studies and found that it's actually more like two. But here's the thing. There's eight of them that didn't make it. So that's why we're here today. I'm going to go through real quick and set up for Lee and for Tom some questions I want you guys to kind of think about with your tech products because these I find through talking to too many people are the things that you really need to consider and they will provide you a framework with starting to answer some of the other questions about your tech problem products you may have. Okay. So, startup failure isn't natural, it's not a law of gra uh, gravity, and it's not a given. That's, that's the good news. So let's do a quick review. So when we talk about an MVP, it's a minimal viable product. It's a product with just enough features to satisfy early customers, provide feedback, and of course to develop for your future product. Okay? There's a term I use also that I want you guys to think about. It's called a launch product. This is the product with enough features, okay, so notice just enough to enough features to basically satisfy customers but also develop your revenue stream. So those two things are going to make it a little bit easier for you because your MVPs don't necessarily have to have all the technology that your, left, your launch product has. So that might give you a little uh, comfort at night to sleep. So let's talk a little bit about what I'm going to call the magic four. So basically, we want your product there, right? We want it to be successful. So I'm going to give you four questions that are key to your success. Is your tech product truly unique and cannot be copied? Okay, so these, by the way, it doesn't really have to be a tech product. It's any product that you make. These are the two factors that you need to think about. So keep that in mind. Lee's going to go over a lot about IP and getting your IP rights and things of that nature. There's a lot of differing opinions on if you should file patents or not, but all that stuff still needs to be considered. So keep that in mind with your product. If your product can be copied by someone else, then it's just chances your competitors are probably going to copy it before you get into market. Okay, does your product, okay, so what does your product need to do to solve an itch? This is goal definition. Again, write this down, I'm not going to go into detail. I um, have talked about it before, but make sure you understand this question for your product. And then I gave you your goal definition is basically it saves time, reduces effort, organizes. 
three to five are optimal, and basically all your strategies and actions should be supporting that activity as well as shape your behaviors and form your habits. Again, this is kind of a drive-by, but keep thinking about this because so many people I talk to do not know what their product really goal is. Okay, will you use it? Now this is kind of a funny statement that there's a thing that we sometimes call a dreamer. And a dreamer is someone that has an idea but won't use it nor can make it. Okay, guess what? A lot of us are dreamers, right? But the reality of it is when you're really in startup mode, the, if you're going to use your own product, you only heighten the success that it's actually going to be successful as well. So what must happen for your product to succeed? I cannot stress this enough. And, and actually there's someone in here who uh, we've talked about this before. Capability modeling. This is a very, very classic tech technique. Um, for those of us that have been in the profession a lot, we use a lot of design principles. They will still apply to your tech product. Capability is what is the things that your product needs to do. This is important because if you can't build it yourself, you're going to have to give it to someone and they're going to need to understand what features or capabilities you're building. Okay. So that's display, calculate, sometimes I term it, consider everything it must do. And by the way, the way to start to look at, research similar products and do not confuse this with process. So this is not the process that it does, it's the physical capability. Again, this is a bit of a drive-by. Okay, number three, can you make it or know how? This is the other one that I found so many times becomes the big limitation, is that you've got an idea but you can't make it. So again, Great techniques for this, find a co-founder, something of that nature, but again, the more you can do these things, the less, the more um, apt you are to be successful. So, what actions must occur and who um, needs to do them? Lee and Tom are going to talk a little bit about resource planning and those types of things, but this is really a key aspect of your product development. So again, plan, suppliers, contractors, we all talk about, as Lee mentioned, you know, he has consulting capabilities. I mean, both of us, I think, play in open source. All those things are things that are assets around contractors, suppliers, and resources that you can use. And then, of course, will someone pay for it? Believe me, there's a lot of people that come in and they don't know if someone will pay for their product. I hate to tell you this, unless you're a nonprofit, you're going to have to figure that out, right? So here's the thing. Validation. Really look from a perspective, if you don't know that, start validating with friends and family, sample target customers, other startups. Start talking to people about, hey, if you had this and it could do this, what would you pay for it? That's the simple way of starting with it. Because most likely, if you don't have, here's what guarantees also on your success to a certain level, is if you don't have some way to show people that you're talking to, if you're looking for funding, that you have some way of generating a revenue stream, I'm going to give you the, just don't waste your time. And I'm, I'm really trying to cut to the chase because most people think, hey, I'm going to come in, I got this great idea, I'm going to tell you and you're just going to give me a bunch of VC money or angel funds, right? That's what most people think you're going to do with this. The reality of it is, in the end, they're going to say, show me the money. How do you make money off of this great idea and that type of thing? So again, those are some framings. Now again, this is quick because we're a panel and we want you to ask questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lee, and Lee's going to go over some more detail. Thank you, Marjorie. And let's see which one's for it. All right, I've talked to a number of people in the past. I've been a mentor with I-10, what, 10 years now, something like that. You're pretty that's all I <laughs> Uh, when I talk to somebody, it's it's really interesting. I can spot them, and after two minutes, I can I can tell if they know their product. By knowing their product, I mean know how it functions. That's one of the big things in the startup space. You can't skip that. You have to have the knowledge. For an MVP to succeed, from a tech, especially from a technical standpoint, you must know where is your IP, where how is it secured. If you hire a programmer in India and he works on your month for product, who works on your product for a month and gets hit by a bus, what do you do? You, know, you have to know where it is. You have to have it stored in some sort of repository in a public space. GitHub's great. I suggest you set up your own. You can get a, you can build your own server on DigitalOcean or ten other providers for five bucks a month. And that, that's less than a cup of coffee. Starbucks. 
when you develop a product, you have to know yourself a little bit about the technology. I'm not saying you need to know how to code, but you need to know what the implications are of the technological path you're choosing. If you want to go iPhone, you have to use their tools, you have to use their platform. If you want to go Android, you have to use their tools, you have to use their platform. If you're building a cloud back end, you've got a few more choices. Uh, you need to understand that, and at each step of the way, in that startup that you're building, you need to keep notes, keep a record. Make sure you know what those decisions are and you can justify them. To yourself first, but you're going to also have to justify them to an investor. One of the things I like to recommend is that there be someone on the team, uh, oh, wait, Melanie, I don't, I don't mind if you share the slides, so you know, if somebody asks for a slide, I'm okay with it. Uh, Somebody on the team needs to understand that expertise. Not to manage it, but to at least keep track of it. Uh, do you want to build your, your MVP in a quick off tool, like a, a wireframe tool, I'll mention some here in a minute. You need to know what those implications are. If you build something in a wireframe tool, you have to start over when you want to expand to a real product. You spend a little more time up front with the real tools that you would use for the product, that gives you the ability to scale. You can move to the next version, you can scale a lot easier than you can. We're starting with the modeling tool. What's your time frame? If you want to get an MVP out this month, you've got a limited choice on what you can use. But realize whatever you build is not going to be useful when you get funded. You're going to have to go back and start over. Scaling. Same kind of thing. You can build an MVP or a launch product. But, what do you do for the next fix? How do you roll it out? Let's look at some of the details. Start off with, I would propose that the intellectual property of a startup is the most valuable piece of that product. Okay. Anybody have any question about that? Yeah. When you say IP, do you mean patent or do you mean just no, the technology? No. The intellectual property that you're building in that organization. It's a code base, it's the people that understand the code base, you've got developers, you've got technical managers, many different roles, but it used to be you put a filing cabinet and put a safe lock on it. You know, nowadays you have to do it to manage it in a different way. But that IP is what an investor is going to want to see, and you better know how it's managed inside and out. Uh, you know, a code base is the big thing. You put it, build, you put, you know, build a Git repository somewhere, I like to recommend you build your own. You can also use GitHub, pay for a service, set up your own server. But you need to be able to track it. You need to be able to understand it and also explain how it works to a model that doesn't know what you're talking about. Not to interject too much, but the, the one thing I'll point out on just because of that conversation is that as a startup, the thing that you want to protect from an IP perspective is the contracts you have to you establish with your customers, right? So a lot of investors, in my experience, uh, are um, ultimately going to be looking at how your contracts are structured and how you're protecting IP and making sure you're not assigning that out or offering ownership of technology, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that also includes, like, if you bring on a consultant that you Correct. Uh, Subcontractor relationships, outsource or offshore relationships, et cetera. Any, any type of relationship that you have, and, and, and including employment relationships, you need to make sure that they're not taking IP or, or rights to IP with them if they leave an employee and things like that. Question, you copyrighted uh, certain aspects of it as it protected in that way for more Do you want to take, I, so when you get into like copyright law and stuff, I don't know that I'm an expert there. Uh, my opinion is, is that IP and IP protection is more complicated than just copyright. Yeah, that's uh, since your microphone's failing out, why don't you pick it up? Maybe we swap for another mic? Yeah, no, it's good. Any legal tool out there to protect your intellectual property is only good as good as your funds to enforce it and what's actually available to you know that, that people can discover. If you build a, a code product with binary code, you ship it. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's very hard to reverse engineer. If you build, if you write a book, that's what copyrights are designed for. All they protect is the 
words you have in there, in there, and the order they are in, and the basic protections to prevent somebody else from selling a copy of that. Uh, beyond that, if you have code and I can read it, or a programmer can read it, they can figure out what you're doing. And you said something like a, a tangible expression protects it. Yeah. yeah. But but the point is, if I can read a thousand lines of code and see what they're doing, I can turn around and recreate them in a different language. And then that's called a copycat. <laughs> well, not, not exactly. I use different variable names, I use different techniques, I use different statements. In the IT space, uh, I like to joke uh, that we deploy the case methodology often, copy and steal everything. So <laughs> if, if the wheel has been invented, why reinvent it? At the end of the day, if you can model an algorithm, model uh, an approach, you're going to. So if you allow that to be public or discovered, shame on you. Well, and also. Sorry. In open source alone, we've got like 27 billion lines of code available. So I'm going to tell you everybody, it's just like in language. I think everything's probably been said, we're just not aware of it. So I would say, you know, there, there's a lot of code out there already. So again, I think, the, uh, I think what the gentlemen are saying with, you know, protecting the assets is important. But again, the real thing is the functionality and the way that you're using the functionality. Because if you look right now on the internet, even with things like a blockchain that's fairly new and, and those things that are coming out, they all explain kind of the implementation of what they're doing in that instance. So, you know, that's always the trick with, with code engineering. Exactly. I can go out there and find 100 open source projects to solve a problem. But to put it in a black box that does a specific job is something I might be able to have. That's what I want to protect. And if you, have, if you have any questions about that, you know, I'm registered on the I-10 site, you can meet me, I'll be, I'll be glad to work with you. But some of the details are probably beyond the time we have here. <clears throat> the bottom line, the takeaway is, you need to know what your IP is and how you secure it. And the corollary to that is, don't be afraid of open source. It's a good way to learn. You can use open source as much as you want. You just can't turn around and release it as a competing product. That's basically the, the way it summarizes it. Hey, you know what? Quick question. How many of you, is everyone in here doing a tech product that's that's actually a software product? Or does someone have like IoT with devices or anything of that nature? Just as a summary. You have well, IoT? Okay. All right. Well, you, you, okay. even they have software products in them. They do, but just so I understand, what, when we talk about that, that's specifically software. There's some other device considerations if you're patenting your device and all of those kinds of things. So I just want to see who the, the audience is. Thanks. Yeah, and, and by the way, patents are good. You can patent a product based on open source software. In case you're getting was you a functional patent or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> but you got to have 25, 50 grand in the bank to do it. So you're better off leaving that for phase two. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> some other, some other. Uh, how are you going to maintain it during product development? You may have one team in Timbuktu, another team here. No matter where those teams are, you, as the creator of that MVP and that startup, you need to know how you can see the code. Because if you have a question, email me, email another mentor, email another peer, and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You need to have it stored in a secure place, but that is accessible from the outside and is not subject to the politics or environment or whatever, wherever those developers are. <clears throat> and what if your team changes? What if you hire a new developer? Well, if you control their repository, all you have to do is cancel their login. They're out. You don't have to worry about who physically has the code, or I can be sinking in somebody in India going, yeah, go ahead. Well, intellectual property is one thing. Like, how comfortable should you be with sharing the concept and business plan of your idea or startup? Because you know, the company doesn't need value in fact he's not assigned to it. In terms of the big picture, I always suggest breaking it down into functions and try to assign those functions to different teams so nobody actually works on the big picture except you and the people that you control. Right? What do you like if you're seeking funding and you have an idea and a business plan aside from like the technical aspect of it? 
concept, and that concept is how how you get the money. Right. I, so, uh, as someone who's raised money, is is raising money as we speak. Uh, I, I'd say that you have to be willing to be vulnerable and transparent in that sense. Uh, in my experience, ideas are free, uh, but it takes real courage and, and discipline to actually turn them into something. So um, if your idea is unique enough, you're going to have to translate that into sort of the unit economics of success that an investor is going to want to see. But if you, if you portray it in, 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 in a way that they can understand how you'll be successful, that doesn't necessarily tell someone how they're going to build it or exactly what it is in terms of the IP you're going to create to achieve that success. So I think you have to be transparent, but it's really driven towards how is my idea unique? How do I have a market for my idea? And how, therefore, am I going to um, convert that market into, into revenue, into dollars, into success? Uh, so if you model your, your story correctly, then I don't think there's a concern from my perspective. And, and remember, first to market doesn't necessarily mean they become dominant. So we can look across lots of products. There, all, there are a lot of similarities in, in products. Doesn't mean that just because your idea is the first to market means that it'll dominate. So if you look even just like, let's say, Uber, right? Now we've got Lyft, and we're going to see more in that market. So again, it's the uniqueness and the factors of your product and the capabilities. So I'm going to keep saying things over and over. But those capabilities of your product are really what's going to assemble what is that IP that's physically created that you're going to secure. And, and to that point, I'll just add really quickly, like I think I actually, so I'm, I'm first to market in a sense in what I'm doing right now. And, and in some ways you can become complacent, like Uber did, and Lyft came to the table and they implemented ride sharing, uh, and now Uber has their right. So you can actually achieve innovation through competition, and so I think that's actually healthy. So putting your idea out there will actually help you raise your game, in my opinion, uh, to really be, to stay the market leader if you are the first one to the table, if you want to stay in that position, invite competition. All right. <clears throat> your team may change, transition a new phrase. Again, what if your developer goes away? Are you sure that you know where the code is? And if you use a, uh, there's something called a repository, for those of you that may not be totally conversant. A repository is a secure location where you store your code, and you can also see who's making changes. You can do a git log on whatever files you want to look at and see who made, who made the change, what comments they entered, who committed. So what, uh, outside of any repository, you can watch your developers and see what you're doing. Anyway. What, can I, I want to ask. Yeah. So just to clarify, you have, well, we have a developer working on something with a team behind him. So at this point, I should say to him, tell me where it's stored and I want it moved no, no, no. Uh, okay. They they hopefully have their own internally. So if you don't have an outs external setup to mm -hmm. say, hey, we want to set up an external copy just for backup and protection, would you, would you push your repository out to here and make sure you update it? Oh, right so just set up the... Is it an employee or, or an, outs or is it an outsource relationship or an employee relationship? He's working with one of the founders because the founder is a private equity who's going to invest in something else with him. So it's sort of a partnership okay, a little so bit. Kind of, yeah, okay, got yeah. yeah. Oh, so I would tell him we want a parallel, we want a parallel activity in our own repository. No, no, it's, it's just an upstream repository. An upstream repository, you know, okay. You know, uh, go to Digital Ultra for five bucks a month, assuming okay. it's less than 25 gig. You install get there it's hey would you push to this remote okay. just so we have a backup copy. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's a backup. It was May 6th National Backup Day, I think it was. Everybody, everybody back everything up on May 6th. Okay, that's <laughs> <laughs> March 6th, sorry. Yeah, once a year, March 6th. Yeah. Anyway, the point is you might have multiple developers. Right. But you have a central repository that everybody saves where everybody saves their updates when they commit them which ensures that if they get hit by a bus, your product doesn't go away. To put it in a different way, the idea is that you own the code. So how are you ensuring that they deliver what you own? Right, right. I mean, we just saw it with our website. It ended up being hosted in some weird place, and we couldn't get it. 
they, they said, oh, you don't own this. So I, this is hitting a core. Thank yeah, you. I mean, anyway, the, the corollary to that is make sure that they use an industry standard or repository mechanism. Like yeah. Git. Git is, the, is probably the best, arguably, free, free product. It's simple to use once you know what you're doing. There could be a little bit of learning curve there, but it is trivial to add a remote repository to whatever they're using and push their updates. Okay, thank and, you. And I want to tell everybody right now, this is the great thing about I-10. There is so many mentors and everything. If what we're saying doesn't make sense or you're starting your process, don't go give money or anything to anybody to develop without at least understanding fundamentally what needs to happen. Because otherwise that's... You know, it sounds like you've got that covered, but I, I can't stress that enough because well, she doesn't have a remote password. I'm well, glad. At least, she, at least, yeah. I mean, it's it, been very to that point. It's been very easy in my experience to. Um, I have an EIR relationship. If you're familiar with the Entrepreneur in Residence program with I10, I have a relationship there. If there's ever anything that I'm like. I don't know what I'm doing. I need someone to review this. Please tell me yes, no, maybe so. Uh, I can find someone very quickly that would look at that situation and say, nope, that's appropriate, or no, you need to change this, this, and that. So don't be afraid to establish the relationship first so that you have that resource available to you because it's been invaluable to me. My mentor rescued me on this website. I mean, so, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, some people call it escrow. It just means they're living 30 years ago. It used to be you'd send a tape to a vault somewhere and physically put it in a vault, but the repository today serves the same purpose. Never depend on a program working alone unless you have that knowledgeable or unless you it can prove that they have a remote repository and that you can access it. I also recommend that you control it. That repository that you access, it's fine if they have a local. But they, it's trivial to add a remote. They can push their updates to the remote at least on a daily basis. Find somebody that can help you read the logs. Uh, any one of us can do it. Yeah. You know, if there's any, especially if there's any possible issue or question that comes to mind. Uh, if you have any input in the, or selecting a team, see if they know what Agile is or test-driven development. If they do, that's a big plus. I don't want to get into the details, but OCI is a big shop. They do have, you know, asynchrony used to be, but now they're part of, uh, what am I? Uh, worldwide. worldwide. Yeah. Arlene's another one, too, from instead of that. Yeah. Proper tools and techniques. Again, if somebody tells you they don't need a repository, go somewhere else. Because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, some different development uh, tools, team communications. It's but it's really good if your team uses something like Slack. Slack is free. Uh, then you can set up multiple channels in there for your project, and you can watch the conversations. You know, you, you can log in in the morning and see who's you know what problems were there, who said what, and it's archived permanently. Sometimes to your own demise, to buy the way. <laughs> Slack is like having a thousand inboxes. I love it though, but I have to add the little. Uh, yeah, it, it, it can be fun. You don't have to watch it. You don't watch everything, but just scan the list and make sure nobody. Make sure and at least make sure nobody's putting cat pictures on. Uh, let's see. Oh, here it is. The development process is majority of the time an integral part of the MVP or the launch product. Uh, I'm sure you guys do. You know, you're now out key space, right? Yeah. You know, you've got local repositories, your local repositories. You've got pro probably got good practices because you're dealing with it right to start. I mentioned again already. Um, you need a project management tool once you get above a, a, a single developer, a couple of developers. We use Redmine. It's a very capable tool. It's also free. The only software we use is free. You can look it up if you want. Uh, one of the things is Redmine. It gives you the ability to track development. It can link to the repository, show you what's going on. You can keep records of time in there. Uh, don't depend on email. Real-time communications will really give you a better picture of what's going on. 
Again, you don't have to participate. You don't have to read every one of the thousand posts from yesterday. But just scan the list and you know, look for any red flag. We talk about real-time communications. Uh, again, Slack is a good one. It is free. If you want an open source product, we use Rocket Chat also. Now, if you want, if you have analyzed your MVP process, if you under, think you understand where you are, what your options are, it might be good to put an MVP together quick so you can put it in front of uh, uh, a peer or not necessarily a uh, focus group, but possibly develop a relationship with customers. Hey, would this kind of tool be good? It would be of use to you. I might call Rich up at OCI and say, hey, Rich, anybody might be able to use something like this and we'll talk to them. How much would they pay for it? I'm going to keep reading saying that to everyone. Well, that, that's further down yeah. the line. I want to know if they, if they want it. If they really get hot for it, they say, oh, okay, give me a blank check. Uh, Balsamic is one, wireframe.cc. Now, these are reasonably, they're, they're web-based products. They're actually free to use until you get up to a certain level, then you commit, but it's not expensive. Uh, iCounting Framework is a, is a decent wireframe tool for mobile apps. Again, at this point, you understand what your time frame is, you understand what your limitations are. If this is appropriate, you know, here's some choices. On the other hand, if you uh, get somebody interested and you get some funding, you're probably going to start over. You know, with the live tools that you can build the actual app in. So I mentioned open source software here. Uh, it's also called free. The majority of today's development for non-specific corporate applications is done with free software. You know, if, if you're in a corporate world, you're tied to Outlook and Exchange and all that, fine. Your set of tools come from Microsoft. If you're doing anything else, you're getting it from the free software community. And there's pluses and minuses for both sides. When we, when we go out to the project, they say, what's the software cost? Nothing. Well, how do we pay for it? We pay us to do it. But the tools we use are industry standard. The open source community is arguably better supported than any commercial product. Anybody ever be able to get a question and answer from Microsoft unless it's a sales guy? In the open source world, I many, 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 many times, I pose a question provide the right data, post it to the mailing list for that project, the guy that actually wrote the code will send me an answer the day later. Uh, you will never find that with a commercial tool. In addition, open source gives you the ability to change it yourself. What are you using? What is your startup using? Do you use Outlook? How many of you use Outlook? How many Thunderbird? How many Gmail? You know, Gmail is a reasonable community out there. It's all web-based. Uh, there are some things about Google I'm not a big fan of, you know, because I don't like them selling my browsing history. So the only browser I use is Firefox, and the first thing I install is NoScript, and I block Google Tag Manager, Google Ag Services, and the other five or ten that Google has, because that's my personal preference. Team technology. Once you get anywhere near the MVP stage, you, the leader, the owner, the creator, you need to be really careful about keeping track of what's going on. And you can't have your, your developer team going off in a different direction that's going to kill you the next time you want to upgrade the product. You know, what if they choose Visual Basic instead of C Sharp? Well, all of a sudden, boom, your scaling options are cut off at the knees. And you can't scale it. You can't run it in a uh, cluster. And I, I think to that point, really quickly, I'll just add that, that one thing that you should just consider is talent. Uh, as you scale your team, you have to know that you can find the talent that can implement the stack that you've um, chosen at the beginning. And so just do a, a quick sort of lay of the land of, of the technology that you're using or the technology that was chosen for you and make sure that there's going to be some talent on the other side of that. And again, you don't have to know the technology. 
you can ask any one of us or anyone at I-10 or any of your peers for input on that technology selection. But be sure you understand what those answers are. And I'll also say that there's no perfect answer because it's never black and white and there's always trade-offs. So just understand that there are always trade-offs. There are always pros and cons. Uh, depends on what you want to do. Of course. And also, <laughs> one of the biggest mistakes I see people make, you know, a, a business person with a good idea says, hey, Lee, I want to do this, that, and the other. And oh, my, my grandkid knows everything about it. That grandkid may, may know how to play a video game, may know how to use a game console. His, his, his or her thumbs are faster than lightning, but I guarantee you they can't develop an MVP. You need to understand what those capabilities are. Playing a game, uh, doing Facebook, playing around on Snapchat, that is not a technical skill. That's a time-wasting skill. <laughs> All right. Uh, as, as uh, the comment was made, choices are multidimensional. Everybody, every choice has a given set of issues that come with it. There's pluses and minuses every platform. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, pick a mentor and talk to them. You know, I'll, I'll always answer email. You know, whether or not we're connected long term. Every platform, every framework, you will see terms like that. Platform, framework, language. Language isn't the whole picture. If you want to build a website, PHP is a pretty popular language. But there's 20 different frameworks that you may need to ask some serious questions about before picking one. Some are good, some are bad, some are well supported, some have been abandoned five years ago. And you need to ask those questions, not that you're going to know the answers, but Google is your friend. You know, read, you know, log up, you know, find where the website is for that <coughs> platform or framework. We'll look at it. Has it been updated in the last couple of months? Uh, you know, look at the forums if there are there. See how active they are. You can get, get a good sense of the current status of that project or that framework just by doing a little bit of research. And by the way, there's a huge paradigm shift going right now if you're in technology. A lot of these platforms that we had before are really what, I don't know if you, this is a familiar term, but it's called monolithic. So they're monolithic platforms, <coughs> we're moving more into microservices and different platforms, even the way we develop software has greatly changed. So again, if those terms don't resonate with you, again, find people that can discuss that more. Maybe we can have follow-ups on those kinds of aspects of it because the frameworks you choose are going to lock you into a direction and you don't want to get stuck on some of the frameworks that aren't taking you in the direction you need to go specifically if you're like IoT and you really want to do a lot of edge computing, you don't want to pick a monolithic framework that's going to wrap you into not allowing you to develop your componentized modules. So just stuff like that all. It's such a fascinating industry. And just a side question because I'm fascinated with this. Is anybody looking at distributed ledger in your capabilities? Does, not, does anybody know what that's called? Blockchain? Have I got any blockchain? Okay. Blockchain completely, if you've not even seen this, it's not even a tech, it's a technology, it's a currency system, it is fascinating. So anyway. Good no one's has that, but that's how much the industry is changing. So again, the more education you have about these changes, the better you're not going to end up getting vendor lock into something that you won't be able to change in the future. One thing I'll add really quickly to think about, so from my perspective, the most important thing you need to know when you're going to try to make a decision on platform is your exit strategy. Uh, because if you, based on where you want to end up, is going to help you make the trade-off decisions that you have to make because ultimately you may pick a platform that won't scale well if you intend to go fast and exit early and that's okay uh, because then it's not your problem right and, uh, it, but in, in, in my opinion it won't dilute your IP or your value etc either so you have to know where you are going to land if you in terms of making some decisions early on how you intend to get there uh, in, in my experience All right, uh, those platforms also affect performance, also affect how much effort it's going to take, how many hours, man hours, man days, man weeks, man months, man years, to build a product. Uh, don't expect concrete numbers up front. Most developers aren't going to be able to give you a fixed bid. 
they're going to say, well, I think this is a six-month project, so if I bring two other team members in, we we'll probably get it done in two months. <laughs> and you know what? The other thing, too, with this I'd recommend, you know, take small chunks to, to protect your investment. Maybe take three, do a, do a design session with those developers and get, you know, two, three-day chunks at a time and really get experience with kind of going through your product and all of those capabilities so you will have a feel that the team gels, you know, they have the right practices, you can ask these questions before you sign up for something 50K or greater. All right. Uh, also, cost is not necessarily irrelevant, but it's not the biggest deal, the biggest deal here because if you've got a project that takes well, the initial bid was what a month and it turned out to be a year. <laughs> that, that's 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 a different set of questions because you're not going to be able to know the budget up front. The first thing you need to do is figure out how you're going to get to an MVP so you can show somebody that that the idea, uh, an investor, uh, VC team, whatever. That's the most important part. Along the way, you need to keep in mind, okay, once we get there, are we doing a wireframe? Do we start over when we actually go to development? That's a viable choice, but will that work for the particular application you're talking about, for the particular product you're talking about? Can I pick on you for a second? How'd you demo your IoT product? How'd you build an MVP? Uh, so I used our reader for that. Okay, so Arduino, you built C code, put it in a repository, managed it, and you did that for your alpha product, basically. Yeah. Okay. Probably not too applicable for everybody in the room, but in, it, in this case, what he's saying is he picked a simple platform, wrote a basic pro, not basic language, but basic functional program for it, and physically built a hardware product to go show people find out they're interested. And then what did you choose for the next platform? Uh, I used, uh, well, I used NetBeans to program it. Okay. I, I just want to highlight something that I heard. So um, I think that when you're considering MVP, you can raise money from multiple sources. My favorite source are customers because they don't dilute you. Uh, and they actually make it easier to raise money from investors. So in my opinion, depending on your model, depending on how you're going to monetize it, et cetera, et cetera, if you can go out to your customers and show them the MVP, get either a contract or a letter of intent and show that to the potential investors, that's way more powerful than showing the investor a product because they don't usually really care about the product. They just want to know that people want to buy it. What do you say, letter of intent? Letter of intent. Uh, if, if you build this, I will buy it, uh, right? So you can actually create a form that they would sign or agree to and ultimately, uh, you know, so getting letter of intent uh, from early Adopters is a really useful technique or a powerful technique. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, I tell you what, we've got some more details here, but nothing that is critical if we have more questions. I'd rather spend more time. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, also, can you flip to my slide really quickly? Yeah. I just want to kind of talk to something really quickly on it. It's, uh, oh, I have one more. Uh, oh, your slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So my uh, my caveat one here, more. one more, is that I am not a graphic artist, so please don't judge. Um, so what I want to talk about really quickly, my experience uh, is because my my job here today is to try to talk about how you get and deploy capital to get to MVP. So from my perspective, it depends on what stage of the journey you're at, but this is how I view it, right? So from a, a founder perspective, you should always be thinking 10x. So you should be thinking about how do I get to this point. And if I've invested correctly, if I have my market uh, validation set up, uh, I should be able to 10x if I simply deploy a team that can implement a sales and marketing playbook. So I want you to think about your journey to a million dollars as you have really uh, two key things that you need to bring with you when you hit that milestone. You need to have a sales and marketing playbook, aka how do I get a customer, and a customer success playbook, how do I keep them. So the first stage of the journey, you're really optimizing to retain the customers that you acquire uh, because that opens up the avenue for funding in terms of where you are in your funding cycle and how you deploy resources. So everything that you're doing in terms of deploying capital, if you're pre-MVP or if you're at the MVP stage and you're pre that million dollar 
mark, you're really trying to make decisions on how you deploy whatever capital you have available to get to that point. You want to get customer validation, you want to have a sales and marketing playbook, you want to have a customer success playbook. If you've done that in a, in a meaningful way, you should have a pipeline now that you can go out and convert by simply building a team to execute those playbooks. And that's when investors will sign up uh, very quickly because they see you have a product, you have a market that's validated that product, and you have a, a team dynamic that you can now deploy in order to bring more customers to the table. Um, so I just wanted to kind of say that my experience, uh, I've done, I've done the, the zero to a million, million to 10 once. Uh, I just completed the zero to one on my second company, and so I'm on the journey from one to 10 again. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I have not yet done the 10 to 100, but I intend to do that next. Uh, so uh, happy to answer any questions you want, but I just wanted to kind of give you that thought, if nothing else, or that framework, just to kind of think about how how you think. When you hit that million dollar mark, you should be in a position to scale 10x, and then you should invest in R&D on that path from one to 10 million in a way that you create the 100 million dollar opportunity. Uh, obviously, it depends on what you're doing and what your product is and how you monetize. There are some models in which you don't monetize early and you're talking about users instead of dollars, right? So it depends, uh, but in my world, this makes uh, uh, sense. So what questions do you all have? Seven and a half minutes for other questions. I don't know if any of you. Oh, you're going to run all the way back to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of thoughts do you have for somebody who's entering a regulated business, such as the financial or securities industry? Um, kind of like medical, you've got this big zero to one kind of quantum of product that you've got to get over. You can't just throw out, you know, here's a little app. <laughs> Um, I mean, it, it, in other words, your your zero to one is a lot better than zero to one on something else. Yeah. So my my what I initially thought when I heard the question is that I think that there's that there's a reason there's a lot of interest from the investment community and fintech and and biotech and some of these things is because they are highly regulated, they're hard to disrupt, and if you have something that can disrupt that industry, you're going to be viewed as extremely valuable. Um, so yeah, I mean, you better know the regulations, you better know what you have to do from a compliance perspective. I don't know, it depends on how you're selling it, it depends on how your customers are going to buy it, but you better be prepared to answer those questions. And, and what I do, security is a very big thing because we, we move data around for companies and a lot of it's financial data uh, and sometimes personally identifiable data. So. I have to have a deep security profile, a deep security uh, review, and some of the customer engagements that I fulfill, so be prepared. Have all of your diligence ready, just like you would for an investor package, have it ready for a customer package. Here or how I protect the data or the assets or the whatever it is that I have to comply to, here's how I provide assurance. Now, something that's come up in my role from a compliance perspective is, is people will ask me if we are certified, and my answer is no, but as soon as someone's willing to pay me to get there, I will. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work for you, but it, it's worked for me so far. Who do you look for to put on your team? So what skill sets to get to that MVP level? Everywhere that I am weak. Uh, so I want to look at what I am good at, and I want to focus my time and energy there. So I, I use a sales term uh, called high payoff activities. Uh, so I want to make sure that everywhere that I'm spending my time are on the highest payoff activities that I can provide to the company at that stage. And I want to fill in around me on all the things that I either hate doing, I'm not good at doing, or have no knowledge or experience or business doing. Uh, so from my perspective, I think you have to look in the mirror first. Uh, and then look at what you're trying to do and figure out how to fill in around you. I don't know if you guys have other thoughts, but that's my experience is build the team around you. Um, and, and frankly, as much as you can, find people that have more experience than you and have been there before. Don't be afraid of that. I know, I know some founders are sometimes afraid of like, oh, they built a company. Maybe they should be the CEO instead of me. And it's like, no, that, that doesn't matter necessarily. If, they, if you can compel them with your vision, they'll join your team. Thank you.
additional questions, they'll be hanging out and up outside the door so we can respect the 6.30 group. But I will say, um, for those of you that are, if you are a tech product company and you're not yet an I-10 um, company, please go to our website, i10stl.org, and click the button that says register as a startup. We'd love to have you. Our, um, we have mentors, we have curriculum, we have programs that get you ready for all different stages of your company, and it's free to entrepreneurs. So, Go check us out, and thanks for coming. And, and, we'll since, and since we're only going to do a shameless, shameless plug, yeah. June 14th, when we talk about kind of the open source, there's going to be a session coming in with IAOT, accelerators, and a lot of different open source. There's going to be some, my organization is open sourcing some new blockchain implementations and all of that. So if you're interested in that, that's already booked. It's going to be coming, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Uh, and, if you're, team. and if you're not a tech product company, but just want to be a part of what we have to do in the community, you can always subscribe to our newsletter at our website as well and find out about all the different events. Um, but thanks so much for coming, and we'll see you next second Thursday.